All right, everybody, good morning or good afternoon, as the case may be. It's 11 o'clock in Chicago by my watch, so it's time to begin. Uh, thank you for attending this PowerCast, Navigating Your HADR Options for IBMI by Tom Huntington and Brian Nornlin of Fortra. This PowerCast is sponsored by Fortra. My name is Ian Kari, and I'm Education Manager for Common. And if you experience any technical issues during the presentation, go and send me a message through chat. Uh, if you'd like to send a written question to Tom and Brian during the presentation for that, you can use the Q&A area, and they will answer your questions at the end of the presentation as time permits. As I said, presenting today are Tom Huntington and Brian Nordland. Tom Huntington is Executive Vice President of Technical Solutions at Fortra and has been with the company for nearly 30 years. He helps manage the worldwide Fortra software engineer team that works to integrate and promote their automation and security solutions to partners and customers around the globe. Also presenting is Brian Nordland. Brian's an Associate Software Development Manager for PowerHA and RobotHA at Fortra. He's spoken at events, webinars, and users groups including Common since 2014, and he is a co-inventor on multiple patent applications and a co-author on technical publications and high availability and distributed computing. With that, I'm going to hand control over to Tom and Brian. Gentlemen, go ahead. Well, thank you, Ian. It's exciting to be here again with Common, and I just want to throw a shameless plug out there for the Power Up event coming in April in Denver. If you haven't signed up, please do. Both Brian and I will be out there on behalf of Fortress, so we look forward to meeting you in person. So today's topic is all your different options for high availability DR um, on the IBMI platform. We'll talk about PowerHA, Live Partition Mobility, Metromir, Global Mirror, Full System Replication or FSR, Hardware Replication, Logical Replication, all kinds of great topics that you're faced with when it comes to what's the best solution for you. And that's really what it's all about. It depends, right? What industry are you in? How much downtime do you have? What's your business requirement for uptime? Those things all come into play. And Brian and I today will walk you through the various options that you have on this IBMI platform. And the great thing is you have options. The bad thing is you have options. So understanding all the technology and the decisions around it are always a challenge. Fortra also puts out the annual state of the IBMI marketplace survey. We did our ninth annual, released it in January. There's a webinar. There's also a free download on our website if you wanna go out and learn about what people are thinking about when it comes to IBMI and HADR is one of the topics. Backup and recovery is also another one that we cover in the survey. But as we see the number third item on customers list this year is high availability and disaster recovery. And then right behind it is IBMI skills, right? And you know, part of skills is managing the server and, and that's where the HADR comes into play. Brian, over to you. Thanks, Tom. You know, as we start talking about uh, all these different solutions and stuff, I, I thought it'd be good to set the stage and, and give some examples of, of different types of, of events that have happened. You know, the in this case, you know, the DMV is somewhere we have to go. We take time out of our day to go there. And in this case, you can see there was a system outage that was impacting uh, appointments and so forth. So you can imagine how frustrating that would be if you went somewhere to go take care of something and now you're sitting there waiting even longer than you had initially planned on. Um, so I'll go on to another example though that I wanted to highlight. Uh, and this is a case where there was a power failure at a data center. And there's a couple of key things with this type of outage. First, power failures are a very common form of of outage that tends to happen. That's something where you can have the most reliable system there is. If there's no power to your data center, even if you have some battery backup, in some cases, not all of the networking equipment and everything remains on that. So uh, you, you might have an outage of that. The other thing I like to point out with this is this was a case of someone else's data center. So potentially where it's something that you'd refer to as in the cloud had the power failure. And so that was something where, you know, the customers for this cloud provider were, were left upset because of that. So as we look at these various things, we have to think about how long can you be down? And in the industry, we talk about recovery time objective. Is it one day, two days? Can you be out for a whole month? I doubt it, but you never know. Uh, but you know, your recovery time objective, do you wanna be back up in five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes? You know, what is your requirement 
for your recovery time objective. And then RPO, what's your recovery point objective? Objective. How much data can you afford to lose? So when you have an outage, there is a point in time where you might have transactions that are in action and not committed to the database. And we have to think about um, that as we choose the various technologies because each of the different technologies might have a different recovery point objective. And that's what we're gonna do today to uncover things. Brian, back to you. Thanks, Tom. You know, as we start talking about, you know, that recovery time objective or RTO and RPO, one of the things we have to realize is our data center is a complex, uh, complex thing. And there are many pieces to it. So as we talk about all the different technologies today, one of the things we'll work to show you is what types of outages, you know, do these different technologies protect you against? Um, so the first type uh, that I'll, I'll talk about is a storage outage. So if we go on to the next slide here, you know, this is this is your things like your, your disks where your data is stored. That might be in the physical server itself, or even more common uh, these days and kind of growing in popularity is external or SAN storage where there is another device uh, external to your system that can fail. Another type of outage, of course, is your physical server. This could be something where it's, you know, you have a hardware failure of that server itself, or it could be something that's maybe a planned outage. It could be something where you're migrating to new physical hardware. And then of course, operating system and software outages. Uh, these are things like needing to upgrade to the new version of the operating system, or as that marketplace uh, survey revealed, you know, cybersecurity is a top concern. Things like staying up to date on all the latest security patches, being able to update another system and switch to it. And then, of course, your data center uh, can also have an outage. This could be something like, like a fire I have here or that power outage. One thing I like to split out from a data center outage is a regional outage. You might have something that impacts your data center like that fire, but if you had a data center next door, it would be just fine. There are other types of events where you might have something like a, a natural disaster, maybe it's a hurricane or an earthquake or, or something else, even a regional power outage might impact you know, a, a sort of geographic area, but you could switch to something further away. And the last item we have on here is an offline backup outage. I mean, right? So we wanna be able to if finally, if need be, rec might have to go back all the way to our backups to recover. it. So these are all the things that we're going to talk about as we go through here. We're gonna help equate to uh, RPO and RTO as we look at these various outages. We wanna make sure that you're considering planned and unplanned outages because it's inevitable, it's gonna happen. Uh, we're going to compare the various requirements against these solutions and, and share with you the ups and downs of each of them, because there are benefits and there are cons to every one of these. And then, you know, everybody has different needs. You're in different industries, different regulations, not one size fits all. So the first thing we're going to talk about is live partition mobility and LPM. LPM has been around for, I'm going to say, what, a decade now on the IBM power server for IBM I it came out first for AIX and then IBM I this can help you with a form of outage a planned outage and we'll we'll talk about that in a bit but here in this case to do LPM you have to be a virtualized uh, environment you have to have external storage and you have to have uh, the vios configured and what happens is that while your users are on the system you can actually move your point of the LPAR to a target physical server. So now I'm sharing disk units and I'm moving the uh, partition from one server to another. So now I could go and uh, do whatever maintenance I need to do to server A while the business runs on server B in a different uh, partition. You're really truly moving the entire operating system and all of its applications that are within that. And this is done for planned type maintenance that we're doing where we want to do something to physical server A while we continue to run our business, right? So we don't want to impact the business application. Uh, we want to plan for server hardware outages. Uh, basically, again, there are some requirements here. You have to have everything virtualized, but it is definitely something that is used in the IBMI world. It's not 
you know, something that um, is out there that nobody's using because this is abs absolutely technology that people use in these virtualized environments. And especially uh, if you go to a hosting company like an MSP outsourcer, whatever you want to call it. Back to you, Brian, to talk about VM remote restart. Thanks. And yeah, one other thing I'll, I'll just add on live partition mobility, another common use case for that is upgrading to the next, you know, new hardware. So to power 10, for instance. Uh, now, of course, live partition mobility, as Tom said, was for um, plant, planned outages. And if we go back a slide, uh, the case where your system maybe isn't there because that physical server has a hardware issue. Uh, you have nothing running that you can move over, but there is a technology called VM restart or remote restart that allows you to restart your partition on another physical server. So this is for unplanned outages. And one thing I'll point out on, on these slides that you'll see is that uh, on the live partition mobility slide, we had a green thing under the, under the outages for planned outages, meaning that you could do that live partition mobility while users were accessing things, there was kind of no impact to them. This one has kind of this, uh, I'll say yellow to orangish color, indicating that it protects you against this outage, but in this case, we're restarting the IBMI, so you will have an outage for your users. So now going on to some other technologies, we'll, we'll start with talking about full system replication or FSR. And the first technology I'm gonna talk about is called Metromere. With full system replication, what we have is we have um, you know, our IBMI and it has external storage. And with that external storage, what we're going to do is have a second external storage device and the external storage is gonna do replication between it so that everything that's on disk is going to get replicated to the secondary external storage device. In this case with Metromere, it is synchronous replication, meaning all data on disk is replicated and that second copy is gonna be identical. Uh, it is limited in distance uh, because of that. The further apart you spread those apart, the longer it takes for that data to get over there and to keep it identical, the system can't continue until both copies are the same. Uh, the secondary server isn't accessible uh, with Metromere. Uh, however, it can be started instead of the first. Something to keep in mind with full system replication is it requires bandwidth for your application data, the operating system itself, but also with temporary storage. And with IBMI's single level storage, temporary storage gets pushed out to disk a lot more frequently than it does on other platforms. If you wanna do some testing in the full system replication environment, uh, you can stop replication and bring it online. Something you got to keep in mind, because it's an identical copy of the system, that means the IP address and network configuration is all the same, same with startup scripts. So you might have to do some manual, you know, fix up or other things to make it come up so it doesn't conflict with your primary production system. When you are done, if you are doing testing of, of some sort, you have to pick which of those, which of those system copies do you want to keep, and then you throw, throw away the other one. Um, one thing is it is very easy to set up and it's very easy to manage. And there are some tools and products that we'll get into a little bit later on how you can make that even easier and automate some of that. So with uh, Metromere full system replication, because we have two storage devices in here, it protects you against a storage outage. And since we have two you know, physical servers in this picture, it protects us against a server or hardware outage. Um, because we have a single copy of the operating system that we're replicating, it doesn't protect us against those operating system outages or being able to do something to that and still have users access the system. But it does protect, protect us against a data center, provided we've put these in separate uh, data centers. With Metromere though, again, since it's not, um, so, since it's synchronous, you can't spread it across the globe or your system's gonna basically grow to a crawl. Um, so it doesn't protect you against those regional outages. Um, you can do backups in this environment by say stopping that replication and maybe doing it on that target server though. Uh, we'll go on to the next flavor, which is in those instances where we do wanna span the globe, there's a technology called Global Mirror. Um, and so 
Global Mirror is nearly identical to Metro Mirror in terms of the types of things that it does for you. But you'll notice there's one uh, kind of, or two words highlighted on this slide, asynchronous replication. This means that the production system is gonna write its data down to disk and that external storage is gonna get it to the target side eventually. Um, so it doesn't have to wait for that. That means that your recovery point is slightly worse in that that secondary copy is not exactly identical, but you can span the globe with it. And the type of RPO that you might see is going to be very dependent upon your application. So it could be that you have an, uh, an you know a, a low workload and and maybe you have a lot of bandwidth between them. You might see even with Global Mirror, you might see a very low RPO in the in terms of like a second or two. But if you have a high workload and maybe you don't have enough bandwidth. To, to handle the peaks of your workload uh, during during the day, you might see that that RPO creeps up there higher, you know, higher, and then decreases during your low points of your day. Uh, so this page looks very identical, almost to the Metro Mirror one, other than we're now protecting against a regional outage in this case. So with full system replication, I mentioned there's various ways you can do it. The first one is you can roll your own, own solution to this. So this is where you set it up and you, you're responsible for managing it in terms of ensuring that you're looking at the right things to know it's set up right and that you know the right steps to be able to perform the switch uh, in order to prevent any sort of data loss or, or data corruption, something that there's many people who do it this way. This gives you flexibility to use any storage, external storage that you want because it's tools that you have versus some of these other tools uh, such as the IBM uh, now technology services full system replication manager um, is only going to support certain storage devices, but you get automation with these tools. So the IBM technology services stuff automates and manages the replication and switching. Um, it does have a set separate partition that's running on IBM I. Um, doesn't require any virtualization or anything. And it does help with some of that managing of say IP address fix up with some startup scripts and so forth. Another common option is IBM has a full, full product called IBM VM Recovery Manager for DR that automates and manages replication and switching as well. One difference here is the orchestration and graphical interface partitions uh, for this product, run AIX instead of IBM I. Um, it also requires everything to be virtualized, uh, but it has some more flexibility sometimes in the in the operating systems it can switch. Uh, and it tends to be a great option sometimes for some of those managed service providers because it allows that easy combining with things like live partition mobility and, and uh, this full system replication. So over to you, Tom. Thanks, Brian. Uh, let's talk about flash copy as this fits into your IBM I environment and some of the requirements for it. So flash copy, again, is another technology that's probably been around for a decade or so. And um, it does work with your various SAN storage units that you get from IBM. So um, not to just say this is an IBM only type technology, but flash copy is truly IBM eyes, but there are other storage providers out there that have similar capabilities. Uh, but we're talking IBM today. So with flash copy, what you're doing is you have your active server, active partition, active VM, whatever you want to call it. And you're going to take a flash of that. So basically you're replicating your production data to another area inside the storage unit as an image of that um, that original data. And a lot of times we refer to that as like a thin partition. Okay, so that's flashed. Um, and then basically, uh, you took that flash at say 10am in the morning, so you can do it while users are on the system. And again, to Brian's point earlier, it depends on how much activity you have going on and all those things. But for most people, they can do a flash while users are active. And anyway, so then what we do next is we can power up this new partition that we've created and we can do our backups over there. And then we can perform our backups. We could even do testing over there. 
Uh, keep in mind, because again, it's an, an exact duplicate, you have things like IP addresses that are the same and, and how you control that within your network is important to think about. But the flash, once it's done, you can you know, back it up, of course, and power down your uh, IBM I partition that had the flash on it. And basically it goes away and doesn't take up any additional storage. So people are using it uh, with uh, things like uh, BRMS, of course, to help integrate your backups across the production server and the flashed copy so that your production server reflects that you did a backup. So there are definitely integrations there uh, with the BRMS product. Now, again, this is just a repeatable process. You could flash as many times as you want throughout the day if you want to have several different point in time type backups, basically. Um, you know, but this again is all happening in the same data center. So to our point on the coverage slide that we have and what's covered, uh, we'll, we'll kind of sum, summate that in just a bit. And then again, just to remind you that the flash copy has the same IP address, same startup scripts, all those things. So you have to be careful about when you spin up that additional new partition that's been flashed and created by flash and what you do. Now, um, we, we mentioned at IBM Lab Services. Uh, if you don't know, they were rebranded to IBM Techn Technology Services um, sometime last year. And so but you might know them as uh, Lab Services, but they do um, integration with the BRMS product so they can help you out in providing the integration of updating BRMS, uh, you know, information from the flashed system back to production system. And then also, again, we need to resolve that issue with IP address startup scripts. Um, and you need to configure because the system when it starts up is going to use your startup scripts, right? So you probably want to have some kind of logic in there to recognize that it's the flash that you're bringing up, right? So uh, here's just some uh, examples or some suggestions um, on how to configure this uh, to automatically start up and uh, you can create some custom scripts to selectively start correct IP addresses and jobs depending upon what you want to do here. Um, uh, and then again, uh, IBM lab services or IBM technology services has a uh, copy uh, services manager to help you out with this. And then flash copy is also fully integrated with power ha which we'll talk about here shortly brian will cover that topic but if we go back uh to our our comparison here uh brian i'll, I'll have you talk back to this and what flash copy is doing it, yeah so th thanks tom so this is just a uh, kind of putting putting all these different technologies together on one one slide we didn't cover hyperswap today but that is a technology that can protect you against storage outages. Um, something to keep in mind as you're looking at this slide, though, is none of these technologies are checking every single one of these boxes. Uh, oftentimes, what starts to happen is you start to combine technologies. For example, that flash copy technology is typically, if you're looking at high availability, might be combined with other technologies as well, like uh, one of the full system replication technologies or, or so forth. Oftentimes, if you're Doing live partition mobility, looking at something like that remote restart technology is a very common thing because they have very similar requirements in how they work. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it back to you, Tom. Yeah, let's talk about um, OS software outages and how to handle that. And then when we do that, we're primarily talking about three flavors of technologies. We got logical software-based replication, kind of the traditional technology that's been around for 30 plus years. We have hardware replication with PowerHA and Brian will cover that topic. And then we'll talk about the newer technology DB2 mirror uh, for a little bit today too. And that is something that came out with IBM 7.4. So let's cover these topics. First of all, uh, the Fortra company has a logical replication or software based application called Robot HA. And all these various vendors that do this uh, technology use a similar approach. What's going to happen is they're going to take advantage of journaling on IBM I. Journaling is a built-in feature of IBM I. It's a transaction log, basically, of 
changes to your physical files, data queues, data areas, and AIFS. So about 25 years ago, IBM enhanced this technology to add something called remote journaling. Um, and what that means is that as I put a transaction into the journal receiver, it goes to the target system and it's sitting over there on the target system. Now, all the various vendors, for the most part, use remote journaling. Uh, there is one technology that has their own proprietary today. Um, and then uh, otherwise, what's happening is on the backup system, there's a job running over here and it's applying the, or jobs possibly, applying the changes to the database so that these are in sync. And this is technology that's happening in you know, seconds, nanoseconds underneath the covers so that instantly when you look from one database to the other, they should be in sync. Um, these technologies also use the audit journal in a lot of cases for looking for security type changes and or net new objects. They might use the audit journal for that. Um, they will use a combination of the journaling, the applied journal, the removed journal technologies to keep the data in sync, but also in the background doing uh, saves and restores of objects that are not journal. And again, um, journaling has been around since the AS400 and technically I'm old enough to know that journaling was available even on the system 38. Um, so I used it back in those days uh, to basically journal my database, back up the journal receivers, and then I could always apply my changes from that. But so anyways, logical replication, still a lot of customers using logical replication out there. And to Brian's comment earlier, you might combine logical replication still today with some of these other technologies. Of course, you might be doing flash, copy back there. You might even be doing Power HA and have some things that you're doing with uh, software-based logical replication. Just the other day, I was helping somebody do basically what I would call data replication. They wanted to replicate certain files real time to another partition while using Power HA or other forms of replication for uh, to, to have the data backed up using storage type devices. But anyways, we'll see that this does give you full coverage across the board to everything that we've been talking about, adding in now OS software outages because we're replicating the application. Now, when it comes to logical based replication, both the production system and the backup system are active. Um, the backup system might have less processors on it, but it's probably gonna have just as much storage um, maybe not quite as much memory, but anyways, the, the idea is that eventually if uh, you do need to switch over, you can do a roll swap, roll swap as we call it in the industry, and now the backup system becomes production. And, you know, typically if you're a smaller system, you might see a five minute roll swap. If you're larger system, you know, you could see an hour. It just depends upon the environment and what's all going on. So, some advantages of logical replication, which there are. Um, source and target are both active. Uh, we do know we have customers that do things like BI reporting on the target system. They also might create redundant copies of the same library and its contents to another partition or even to the, the same partition for uh, testing or whatever else it may be. Uh, you can perform your backups on the target system without impacting your recovery point objective. Uh, ability to distribute data to multiple systems, as I said. Uh, journaling does use less bandwidth. So if you happen to have a server out in a location where communications is still not good, um, it's better because it's only sending just the changes that are happening to the database. Um, so that should be better. Uh, but some other things to think about, generally the software-based logical replication takes a little more monitoring than hardware-based replication. And um, it also can take and consume more system performance because it's certainly using the system to replicate. Now, journaling doesn't go away. Uh, you should be using journaling pretty much with every one of these applications, I would recommend. Uh, wouldn't you say that's true, Brian? For the most part, they should be journaling? Yeah, yeah, I would say even if you aren't doing a any sort of high availability solution, you should be journaling. It protects you against things like if the system you know, goes down hard unexpectedly, the system journaling has built in things as the system comes online to help, you know, kind of replay transaction, partial transactions or roll things back yeah. uh, so that you don't have damaged objects. Or even think about auditing today. So many of us have to be concerned about audits and who changed what data. The journaling is a great way of being able to re 
produce, what happened, who changed the data, that kind of thing. All right, Brian, back over to you to talk about independent auxiliary. Oh, wait, no, you're going to talk about full system hardware well, replication. I, I will first. start with, with full system hardware replication. Just to remind us of this picture that we talked about uh, earlier, where we had that full system replication. And one of the things I mentioned was, you know, it doesn't protect against those operating system and software outages because of the fact that the operating system is replicated along with it. So what we really need is a way to kind of throw that out and separate our operating system from our application data. And on IBMI, that is called an independent auxiliary storage pool or IASP or IASP. And it's a fancy term to say it's all you're doing is separating, um, you know, basically the operating system out from your business data. One way I like to think about it is uh, something like a, you know, a USB flash drive that I might plug into my PC. I might store my, my stuff in there and unplug it and I can plug it in anywhere else and access that same data. It's a very similar type of concept, only on IBM I, it's a lot more integrated uh, to the system. Yeah, Brian too, I think if I remember right, about two years ago for Common, we did a power cast on how to create and work with independent auxiliary storage pools. It's been a little while, but still relevant, yeah. uh, relevant content. That, that it is. All right. And, and you know a couple other things about them. They can be taken online and offline without restarting the whole system, just like that flash drive. Something else I like to point out though, there are some objects that don't make sense in an independent ASP. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about those a little bit more uh, in a few minutes. So what PowerHA is, is it's hardware replication, but with independent ASPs. So what we are now doing is we are only replicating your application or your business data instead of the entire operating system. So as we go along here, um, one of the things we'll see is we, we might have users accessing our system. What we can do on the target side is we can do something like update the operating system while users are accessing the production. That could be a full operating system upgrade or it could be an update. Once it's done, we switch users over to that other system. So the only outage we had was the amount of time it took us to end our applications, switch over there. Uh, we didn't have to wait for that whole update to, to complete. Then, of course, we can continue on and update the operating system back on our original production, and we could switch back eventually as well. One of the first questions that I usually get asked at any time we talk about PowerHA is, how do we migrate to an independent ASP? Sounds like a huge amount of work. The good thing is, is there's a couple of tricks that make it not, not quite as scary as it might seem. For your IFS data, what you end up doing is you move it from wherever it is into a, a directory that starts with the name of the independent ASP in the IFS. But there's some magic in the operating system called a symbolic link that allows you to link from the old location to the new one. So this means that users and applications oftentimes can look at the data through where they thought it was before, and it magically points to the independent ASP all without uh, them having to change anything in how they work. For your data that's stored in libraries, uh, the process is, is largely you save the library, you delete it from your system, and then you restore it into the independent ASP. Now, accessing the, the stuff in the library does require an additional step called the job namespace. Uh, largely, this is uh, either creating or modifying a job description that has uh, the ASP group, basically the name of the independent ASP set. Um, and then you set users or, or applications to use that job description. And then the data is accessed almost the same way as it was before. Uh, they have automatic access to those libraries that are in the independent ASP, as long as that job description has set to it. There's also a command you can run to, to switch into that ASP as well. Uh, if you don't want the entire job to have access to it at all times, or if you have multiple independent ASPs that you're switching between. As I mentioned, we can't put everything into an independent ASP because it's not always in the, uh, on the system at all times. There are certain things that don't really make sense. Largely, these are security and configuration things, stuff the system needs to, to run. Things like user profiles, printer device descriptions, different system values, and so forth. In PowerHA, these are synchronized with something called the administrative domain, so that when a user profile 
uh, let's say the password is changed, it is propagated to all the nodes within the administrative domain so that when that user goes to sign into the other system, it's been done over there as well. And Brian, I'll add in that, you know, I think of Fortra, I think of our PowerTech products, and I think of Robot, and the various products depending may or may not fit into an IaaS. Uh, job scheduling, for example, is a great system utility that I recommend running in the IS because when you do your switch of your disk down below in this diagram, you want your business application and the process of running the nighttime processing, the day processing, whatever, all integrated, right? So something like robot schedule makes great sense to switch. A PowerTech uh, exit point manager where we're monitoring exit points in the operating system would live in your sysbase but the configuration for that is, but we could actually protect individual files that maybe you don't want somebody to be able to download. So we can reference the libraries. So, you know, it's not just a conch block type thing where you just say, hey, move everything in there, right, Brian? So you have to kind of look at your really system utilities uh, uh, with an open mind that they may still stay in sysbase and administrative domain and other techniques uh, you can and here's again where another combination thing we could run uh, robot ha and sysbase and replicate some of those things right or any of the other vendors that are out there yeah, yeah that's a very good point tom I, I you know an example is maybe maybe you're running some sort of you know you gave the example of like an exit point manager but also uh things like antivirus uh, tools. Sure. Those are things you probably want to run on both your systems since they're both active systems. So you want that installed on both systems and you want, want to have those uh, actively running on those systems. So you wouldn't put those in the independent ASP. Yeah, and that's always a challenge for customers too, because security is security and, you, and your data is your data. If you have two copies of your data, one on source and one on target, you, you need to protect, protect it at all times. Yeah. Uh, Going along the lines of you know some of the advantages and considerations with PowerHA, some advantages, anything you put in the independent ASP is replicated. Because it's replicated at the disk level, um, it, it makes it really easy because that replication is either going or it's not. And because of that, it tends to lead to uh, pretty fast and easy role swaps and less monitoring. Again, you're kind of looking at is the replication currently active or is, is it not? And do I need to restart that replication? You're not having to deal with maybe some of the issues with why it, what, what's wrong with this object? Why, why didn't it get, why didn't the stuff get correctly applied with it? It does use less bandwidth than say full system replication because you aren't replicating the operating system or that temporary data. Uh, something else is if you're using external SAN storage, data is protected and replicating replicated even when that target system is down. So let's say you're performing an operating system upgrade of that target system, and that might take you know some period of time. Because the storage is doing the replication, your recovery point is, is still protected because all your data is over there. Now, it might take you longer to come up if you were to have an outage in that time because you'd have to complete that, that upgrade, but you don't have to worry about that exposure. It can oftentimes be less expensive than, than other solutions. Some considerations, there's upfront work to identify data to be replicated and, and placed into an independent ASP. Although oftentimes you have to do that upfront work with regardless of what, what type of uh, solution you have. That's probably one of the biggest jobs is figuring out what things do I need to replicate? What things don't I need to replicate? Um, also, it does use more bandwidth than logical replication. And then another thing is you can't access that target copy of the independent ASP while replication is active. Uh, PowerJ does have solutions that work with uh, every type of storage uh, from internal storage to SVC and flash systems to uh, IBM's enterprise DS8000 uh, storage. And then IBM has something called Copy Services Manager that manages DS8000 storage as well. And we'll talk a little bit more about these in, in more detail. So the first technology I wanna talk about is geographic mirroring. Uh, so this first slide, what I have here is sort of an example of your standalone system. What we have is we have the system and that system has some, some memory and it has some disk units. And at some point, data is gonna get taken from memory 
written to disk, and then the disk units are going to acknowledge that and your application can continue. With geographic mirroring, what we are doing is we're relying on that concept and the operating system. Anytime something gets written out from memory to disk, it's also going to send that same data across the TCP IP network to a second system so that it can be written to disk over there. That second system will acknowledge that. And you now have two identical copies of your independent ASP on disk. Um, there's also an asynchronous mode where that secondary copy might be slightly behind. But geographic mirroring is independent ASP replication using IBM I networking. Uh, if we go on to the next slide, um, it protects you against all these different types of outages. Again, um, operating system and, and software outages with that independent ASP and, and being able to have two active copies of the operating system. Uh, as far as regional outages, there's a synchronous flavor of geographic mirroring where the copies are identical, or you can make it asynchronous where, where those copies aren't quite identical, but um, you're able to span greater distances. One of the big benefits of geographic mirroring is it works with any type of storage. It could be internal storage. It can be external storage. The storage doesn't have to be the same between the two different copies. It doesn't even have to be the same size of the storage. The system is smart enough to know how to make that, make that happen with that replication. Uh, if we go on here, next I'll talk about external storage, PowerHA technologies. Uh, with the first one being Metromere. Uh, and uh, Metromere with PowerHA is very similar to that full system Metromere technology we talked about a few minutes ago. Only in this picture, we're only replicating the independent ASP. Uh, Metromere again is that synchronous solution, meaning really good recovery point, but we're limited in, the, in distance. Uh, you can't access that target copy of that independent ASP, but you can do what's called a detach in PowerHA which is stopping replication and enabling you to bring that target on, online to maybe perform uh, testing or perform backups off of it. If we go on to the next slide, uh, Global Mirror, again, with PowerHA, this is almost identical to that full system uh, Global Mirror picture we were talking about, only we're now only replicating the independent ASP. So Global Mirror lets us span greater distances again. So our recovery point isn't as great if that production server uh, you know, had a problem. We might be a little bit behind on the other side, but it's going to be you know, on the order of you know, minutes to, to hours instead of going back to that tape backup. It allows for those same features as Metromere has. Another technology uh, that is pretty common, particularly when combined with other technologies, is called LUN level switching. This is where you have a single external storage device and that independent ASP is in it and the data is switched back and forth between the servers. So this gives you the ability to protect against those operating system and software outages and maybe server hardware outages uh, in the environment, but it doesn't necessarily protect you against all the other uh, types of outages. So it is frequently combined with Global Mirror. Again, here, here's kind of an example. If that server goes down, we kind of switch the independent ASP over to what, what's labeled as node B in this picture. Going on to the list of uh, outages it protects against, uh, you know, we only have one storage device. So if that storage device fails, we don't have any protection against that type of outage. However, if you did have an outage of the server you know, hardware, that is something that we can switch over to that other, other system. Some of that's going to be dependent upon. Uh, some, some people set this up where they have two, two uh, partitions within one physical server. And that might not protect against that uh, type of outage, but would give you the other one, which is operating system and software outages. So you could do things like applying PTFs on node B, switch to it, and then do the same on, on node A and kind of reduce the outage window for that process. Uh, this is just an example of combining this with uh, Global Mirror. And one of the reasons that you might want to combine it with Global Mirror is you can then have two systems kind of within your production data center or production site uh, and then have a DR site somewhere further away.
you know, Brian, one of the things I've heard with this type technologies, people will do this for uh, country in country data replication. So you got some of the banking industry regulations around the globe where they have to have a replicated copy, but they also realize they got to get the data out of the country too. Uh, and they're allowed to do that, but they'll use the LUN level switching within their data center to, to do the tick mark on, on that, uh, you know, having another copy within company country and then replicate it out. Yes. Um, and then, and then, you know, another great, uh, extension to that is to combine this LUN level switching with, with something called HyperSwap, where we get an additional, an actual additional copy in there, where in this case, you could, what you have is two, these kind of these two systems, likely within a data center or within a city for A and B, giving you that sort of in-country protection, but then you have C, which is further away that you can switch to uh, maybe in the event that you, you had a sort of regional outage. Um, and so one of the things is once you start combining a lot of these technologies, so this is DS8000 with LUN level switching, HyperSwap and Global Mirror, you'll start to notice that uh, although the colors maybe on the scorecard don't, don't change too much, if you start looking at the details here, if we had an outage of our storage, it, it would be minimal impact to our applications. We'd keep keep running. Um, the recovery point is zero. If we had a server or hardware outage, the recovery point, you know, is, is zero because we have identical copies again. Um, operating system and software outage, because we have one within, you know, a, a regional area, again, that recovery point is very low. Similarly, if these were spread across, you know, maybe a city, the A and B copies, you again have a very low recovery point but it still protects us against that regional outage uh, in the case of, of something that, that's a little more uh, geographically dispersed that impacts our systems. So then the last topic we have as an option, it's a newer option as of 7.4 and 7.5 is DB2 mirror uh, IBM has been working on this technology and the goal here is really to give you two active, active systems that are in sync with each other and you can run your business from either or. They do have a physical limitation. They use a thing called the Rocky cable to uh, keep uh, uh, the systems in sync because they have to have really high speed or the business application slows down. IBM has increased the limits, but still you have to think of this as a uh, best case metro type replication tool and you have to worry about uh, performance if you get your systems too far apart. Um, it does replicate the, the database and um, also now I think recently it's been enhanced uh, here with 7.5 to also do the uh, IFS replication now within the uh, technology. Uh, Brian, anything you add to DB2 Mir? Um, you know, I, th I think Tom, you cover, covered it well. Uh, I, again, it is it is something that that it, typically it is it is that sort of local HA type of thing. So you might still combine it with technologies like uh, Power HA or or full system replication or or uh, robot HA type logical replication solutions um, in addition to DB2 yeah. mirror, so that you have another copy further away. Yeah, good point. And you do need. Um the same hardware, right? I mean, you got to be at the same OS levels, you got to be at the same hardware levels. So it requires, you know, yep. whereas in, you know, case of Power HA and something we haven't even talked about and software replication is there is the capacity backup unit program that IBM has and uh, almost a shame not to have it in this presentation, Brian, but it is a way of having a secondary target that is priced right for HA. And IBM has that offering still, and that's carried through uh, called CBU, Capacity Backup Unit. Okay, enough on DB2 mirror. So the real question is, which solution is best for you? Well, as we said in the beginning, it depends. It depends maybe on industry. It would of course, depends on the business requirement and, of course, the business budget. I mean, those things all come into play, and that's what we've been trying to point out with you. And uh, Brian, uh, this is kind of brings everything together, right? Yeah, this, this is that, that same 
same slide we showed earlier, only we added a, a few more rows with some of the power HA type type solutions, logical replication, and, and DB2 mirror to try and try and get the whole whole picture of what were all those different screens cram, crammed into one one slide. Again, that that green means minimal impact to your production workload, whereas yellow is yeah, you got to restart your workload on the other other system when you do have that outage. Very good. That's a great summary of this. So, you know, we've talked about all this great replication, real-time replication and switching technologies. However, we realize something else that's really important that you cannot forget about and, and not do. And, you know, if we go back to MySpace, they lost uh, 12 years worth of user content. Why? Because they didn't back it up, right? I mean, ultimately, they, they weren't doing backups. They were dependent completely on hardware technology, probably within the same data center, within this, you know, I mean, all those cardinal sins of planning for HA and DR. So um, you do need to plan still on doing backups. Um, Real-time replication software, HA and DR, you know, in addition to that, they're just not a replacement for point-in-time disaster recovery solutions. For example, Another thing we haven't mentioned is ransomware. Unfortunately, IBM I is not immune to ransomware if you have a poorly configured security program too. So there are customers that have had ransomware on IBM I. And even if you have all these HA solutions in place, the HA solutions might get ransomware also uh, when that happens. And more than likely they will because you'll have the same kind of security configuration. So the only re way to recover in those cases are from some type of backup. Now it doesn't have to be a tape backup. It could certainly be a virtual tape library or something like that. Brian, any, anything to add to that? I think you, you covered it covered it well. I mean, it, it really is that thing that these, these solutions that, that provide high availability, they're really good at replicating data um, and that means replicating things like when stuff gets deleted or, or otherwise, you know, encrypted and so forth. Yeah. So what solution's best for you, Brian, as, as usual, it comes back to, it depends, right? That it, that it does. Yeah, it really does. So it depends a lot on your environment. It depends a lot on your industry. I'll, I'll keep reminding you of that. You have to think about your business, what the cost of these solutions are. But I mean, I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations with customers to talk about all these various solutions and to give you insight to what you're thinking about. Um, and then you have to really work with your, your uh, hardware providers around the globe to help you out with the pricing of these various technologies too. And your software vendors, of course, that comes into play. So at this point, um, back to you, Ian. I think we've covered this topic in very exhausted fashion today, but I know we have some questions out there. All right. If anybody does have questions, you can send them now in through the Q&A. There are a few that have mm -hmm. come up already. This first one is, how do we deal with third-party applications like firewalls with PowerHA and IAS, IASPs? So I can take that. That 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 is a great question. You know, one of the one of the things with with something like PowerHA, there's a there's a couple aspects to this question. Uh, one is if you have third party, you know, application, you know, things protecting your system that are running on your system, you likely want to have the same types of rules configured on both your production system and say your your uh, HA or DR system. When talking about external applications and firewalls, something to keep in mind with, with something like PowerHA is you do have a couple of choices in, in how you do things. Some people, when they do a switch to their other systems, will have an IP address that switches along with whatever system is the production system. And in those cases, some of those firewall rules and stuff that are externally configured might follow follow along with whatever system that is. Other ones might be a little more, more picky about that. And you might have some reconfiguration aspects to take care of as part of the switch. Uh, in other cases, you're updating things like DNS, but not IP addresses. And there you might have to, again, configure those external applications or external firewalls uh, to enable access to the target system. Some, some people choose to have those target systems largely blocked off until they go to do a role swap they do that, and then they enable it. 
But then uh, depending on what sort of automation you have in place that can extend the time of your role swap as well. So there, there are a lot of uh, we see, flavors. Brian, we see a lot of DNS name server as the approach that people use that in the network to change the name and the IP address associated with it as yep. they do their role swaps. All right, continuing uh, another still on Power HA. Uh, mm -hmm. Ensuring I understand this, uh, in order to adapt adopt Power HA, we'd have to convert to IASP. Uh, that that is correct for Power HA technologies. An independent ASP is is required. Um, so it's kind of going through those those sets of steps that that we shared on on what's sort of involved in in that. IBM also through their technology services does have workshops that you can go through in, in converting to an uh, independent ASP. And several application vendors also have instructions on how their applications work in it as well. And I'll, I'll again plug, we did a webinar with several steps on how to use IASP on the IBM I platform. Again, PowerHA, Brian's been around 12 years, 15 years, how long now? Since 2008. It's a while, so. Somewhere in the between 10 and 12 or 10 and 13 or 15, <laughs> whatever. Yep. All right, next question. All right, any questions? Again, send them in through uh, Q&A. This question is about DB2 mirror. I'm gonna alter the question slightly. Mm -hmm. um, I think the question wants to get to what sorts of shops are using DB2 mirror in a production environment? Are there a lot, uh, are people using this? It is a newer, I'll take that one, Brian. It's a, it's, it certainly is a newer technology came out with IBM 7.4. There are customers that are implementing this technology. I just had a call yesterday with a customer that's convinced they're going to DB2 mirror this year. So um, I think there's more to come, you know, like any new technology, there are some things that are being worked on yet to make it easier. Uh, there are customers that are running DB2 mirror. I don't know how many, um, out there. Anything else you'd add to that, Brian, or not? I think I think you covered that one fairly well, Tom. All right, very good. And they, I mean, you'll see in 7.5, there's some new updates for DB2 mirror and I believe some TRs related to it too. But it is new technology. It's not as widely used as software replication or hardware replication. But the beauty is IBMI, you got options. All right, uh, last chance for questions. Put them in the Q&A panel while we're waiting to see if there are any final questions. I will say the people did ask about the replay and the handout from today. Uh, yes, both of those will be available on the Common Learning Management System, the Content Management System uh, from tomorrow. Uh, you'll get an email when that's available. It usually takes less than 24 hours to turn that around. Any last questions? Not seeing any, why don't we end a couple minutes early? Uh, thank you, Tom, thank you, Brian. All right, thank you, Ian and Common. Again, we'll see you out in Denver in April. All right, appreciate it. Looking forward to it. Yep. Thank you, everyone. All right, bye-bye.